Hello, welcome to True Hoop with me, Gerard Hector and Henry Abbott. How are you, sir? Good, thank you. How are you? I'm excellent. And we have Sports Illustrated editor and author of Mind Game, Julie Kligman. See, here's her book. And it's out today, folks. Today, March 5th. Julie, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We are excellent. Um, so we're super excited to have you on. I will have to say, say this. So Henry just finished well, the second draft of his book was submitted. So he is not where you are, which is, oh, this baby is printed out the door. But I feel like he has some <laughs> some commonalities, some kind of feelings oh. about he wants to share with you right now. No, I just okay. have like, I, yeah, first of all, congratulations. I mean, <laughs> holy smokes, you. how long were you working on this thing? A few years. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. So, and the fact that we're talking to you on the actual day, like I feel, does it feel like your birthday? Does it feel like a, it's a big deal, right? It does kind of feel like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm excited to be talking to you today. Um, yeah. That's really all I want to say at this point is um, I, I have talked to so many authors for so many podcasts through the years and always been a little blase about like, oh, you got a book, but not, not my view anymore. <laughs> my view now. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have wrung the marrow from life and put it into this project. And I want to honor that work because I understand. Actually, I did notice that you think the coffee shops in Queens where you spent your time, like, yes, totally, totally get that. This is where you, <laughs> this is where you spilled the blood, right? Like, just like, oh, we got to do all this work. Yeah. So congrats. And, and thank it, you so much you also loved uh her dedication right at the top of the book which badass, i thought was pretty badass, badass. So badass. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like this is for my dog it wasn't like this is like for my mom it was um well do you want to read it do you want to me to psychiatrist read it? who told me i'd be dead by now i'm not well <laughs> julie what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've seen a lot of bad psychiatrists, um, some worse than others, obviously. Um, and I just, you know, I, I was having trouble coming up with the dedication. and But I still think about how angry I was at that time and just like, fuck that guy. <laughs> I didn't even know. I thought that was like probably the first day of psychiatry school. I was like, never say this to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yep, sure. You would think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that, that, that didn't work out so well. So obviously... <laughs> In many ways, well, yes, we're happy you're here, but that, I'm sure, had some motivation in spurring you on to write this phenomenal book. Um, yeah. And, you know, this is such a complex uh, topic and talking point and issue, um, and I really wanted to start out because your foreword um, was written by uh, from WNBA player um, Leisha Clarendon, um, who uh, is transgender activist who but so much of her forward was just about the struggle that an athlete goes to just to try and make it right like like just forget about like the day-to-day -day, all right i made it now i have to like grind through the season just to make it and there is this disconnect between the athlete as a whole human uh who also has feelings um who also right has other things going on and it seems to be sort of running contrary to what we as the larger we not us three enlightened people on this show but the larger <laughs> we in this society think about sports right which is this is just we grind you're a superstar you do whatever rah, right all super aggro mm -hmm. and like and it's like this is really weird like why do we do this thing so why do we do this thing julie <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think we have a tendency again not us three everyone uh, <laughs> you would never to kind of no 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 we're perfect. Um, perfect yeah I, I think society has a tendency to put athletes on pedestals i think it's comforting to be like oh here's this here's this person or this group of people i can root for who are like immune to everything who are perfect um who never experience uh any challenges they can't conquer um i think it's really soothing to have that kind of presence in your life and i think that's one of the reasons people watch sports but you know, it's so harmful, obviously. Yeah, extremely harmful. Um, and I, I love again just how you you the the book starts because it's it's her story, right? Of trying to make training camp that you're with the Minnesota Lynx, which she eventually doesn't end up doing, but how she breaks out into a rash and like all these various things are happening to her. And it's probably her body having a uh, a physiological reaction to yeah this shit that you do every day not good for you <laughs> right like totally that coupled with everything else going on in your actual life outside of the hardwood 
combination, yeah, this is all bad. So I know people love cheering and you love it and it's great, but this is all bad. And this is my way of rejecting you <laughs> or rejecting it and telling you bad. <laughs> let's, let's, let's address some problems we have here. Yeah, I was really glad Leisha was game to write the forward because uh, I'm non-binary myself. And uh, so to get a, a fellow trans person to write the forward and, you know, let alone one of Leisha's stature in the game and, the, you know, in sports and in the world uh, was just incredible. And yeah, like you said, I feel like they did such a good job of laying out like what it takes to not not make it just to survive. Yeah. And it's in Henry, we talk about this in the NBA all the time. It's not just, all right, I make it whatever. Every day and every year, someone is trying to take something from you once you get there, right? Whether it's mitts, whether it's contract dollars, whatever it is. So it's, so you have this fight flight response on the one hand, right? Predatorial things coming at you to take away the thing you've worked so hard to do. I've got to hold on to it and fight. Sometimes my teammates, not literally, although sometimes in some sports, people do fight their teammates literally, right? To stop them from taking the thing from you. And also, again, I have to manage myself and deal with my, I'm having a fight with my partner. We have a mortgage mm -hmm. due. We got kids who are whatever in school. And I just think we, we seemingly have gotten to a place where we're willing to talk about those things. But we're so far away from being, you know, uh, ready to actually have mature conversations about it as a society. But we're moving in the right direction, right? I think. I think so. Yeah. I mean, the past five or 10 years, especially, there's been progress. It's very slow, but but there is progress. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I, my last half hour included like these two little things that seem relevant. Like one was we're about to publish a story about Tyrese Halliburton has just had a really rough week. Like he's, he's not doing the things he normally does. Maybe he's exhausted. Maybe his hamstring hurts. So like you can see on video, he's just like the Pacers are losing every game because they count him so much. And so like think, mm -hmm. imagine being Tyrese, right? You're like, I just need to be like the best version of myself today. And that's not enough. You have to like understand yourself better, right? How to motivate that. At the same time, I've been texting with um, Katie Heindel um, mm -hmm. of basketball. And like, she's writing a book too. We've been a little bit like, uh, book buddies a little bit and uh <laughs> and she's like you know she's like i'm really fighting this thing where like i need feel like i need to like write every day and i need to like be productive every day and like and i was like that's probably exactly how tyrese is feeling too right like they yeah. both have this thing and it's probably how you get a ration training camp right it's like that same exact like it's supposed to be actually like i'm gonna zip, zip ahead we, we're pretty organized here julie but i'm gonna zip <laughs> right ahead to um naomi osaka had an incredible idea i thought which is just get to athletes should get to have an unexplained sick day now and again for sure <laughs> yeah yeah mind blown right like <laughs> <laughs> i mean we have it all the time right in our in our in our lives i don't i mean yeah i'll tell henry uh i'm i'm not like, okay it's like someone else do the pod like right it's easy <laughs> yeah you want to have a press conference when your dog dies like i don't think so you know what i mean like <laughs> definitely right not. right <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of people ask me how I feel about that idea because, you know, as a journalist, uh, you want access to players. But I, yeah, I think you want players to also be present and feeling like they're capable of giving good answers. So if you were able to take a sick day every time, like, screw that, especially if, like, you lose in the finals of a major tournament or something like that, like, I think, I think you should have to show up then. But yeah, every once in a while, if you want to skip out because you genuinely feel like it would be harmful to you, I, I think that's a good thing. You know, it's I love that because as an avid tennis watcher and someone who's gone to a U.S. Open a number of times covering it and tournaments, I thought what Naomi Osaka said was brilliant. Um, but then you have the sort of opposite of that, right? Which is, so she, in my mind, is a good messenger, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have Kyrie Irving, who... It's probably not the best messenger to say I need time off, right? Because right. he'll take an unexcused absence. And first of all, the team didn't even know because he didn't tell them, right? So in that way, you're being not accountable to your teammates and the people who employ you, right? So it's this weird sort of dichotomy and balance we have within sports where I'm all for athletes having what they need. But at the same time, right, there needs to be some level of like check and balance where it's like, dude, you can have time off, but you can't just disappear and not tell us. You're not coming to work today, right? Let us know. Fine. Okay. All good. Yeah, completely. And I think there's a weird thing too with like 
uh, I get into this a little bit in the book, but with like uh, someone like Ben Simmons, uh, you know, it's not like he disappeared. He did say like mental health uh, when he was with the Sixers. Um, but there's a lot of like fan distrust around that. Mm -hmm, and I think mm -hmm. even teammate distrust around mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so what I was looking at was like, well, what do you, what do you do in that situation? I, I personally think you have to err on the side of like believing the person, but it's still really tricky. Yeah. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with teammate distrust, right? Because not only do you have teammates who either will say something innocuous or benign about where the person is, you also have uh, people who cover the sport, right? Former athletes who are in many ways seen as, well, if they say it, then it's true, right? If mm -hmm. they say it's a bad idea, the, all the credibility is lost, right? I think about Henry when Adam came out, it was five or six years ago, with where he was very concerned about the NBA players and their level of happiness and everything throughout the season. And then, of course, Charles Barkley gets on TNT. He's like, these guys make $50 million a year and fly all over the who's unhappy it's like oh please stop right. saying shit like that you're not helpful in this moment at all also you are a self-confessed alcoholic like i mean right. like we can't pretend that everything's just hunky-dory right like why did you drink totally so much, like, like 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 what was going on there were you feeling a little delicate not yourself you know like, like we, we've all been there buddy like it's okay <laughs> like, yeah that, that's part of it right the the permission to not be okay. And it's what you talked about at the top, right? It is comforting to, again, not us, but the most people to know these athletes are impervious. They're, they're, they're impervious to everything. They're superhuman. Everything's great because it makes us feel better about ourselves if they're that way. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if they reveal they're not doing well, well, that means, well, shit, maybe I'm not doing well, right? Right. <laughs> and then right. I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> Totally. And like, you can have all this money and all this fame and, you know, it doesn't buy your mental health. Not at all. Yeah. Every rock star story has this or oh. whatever. You're like, every movie star, like, right, we know this super well, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, and they don't even like, you know, like athletes, I think it has the veneer of health, right? Generally, like they're supposed to, they kind of look like, but they don't live very long. They don't like, certainly NBA players don't, right? Like it's not actually mm -hmm. healthy. It's pretty extreme, right? It's a, uh, you know, uh, you know, so Adam Silver talked to Sloan about this, like, you know, he had a superstar tell him, an unnamed superstar tell him that he would, like, land in the city, put his headphones on, go to his hotel room, like, you know, play a game, leave the city, and not really have meaningful conversation with anyone, right? And, like, mm. um, like well, I mean, you've been marinating in mental health talk for, like, that's, I, that's not good, right? I mean, this isolation <laughs> is not helpful, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty concerning to hear, um, but it's not surprising to hear either. Um, I yeah, I think kind of Adam is right to be concerned about all this. Um, it's it's just I don't know. The, the things we put these people through are, like you said, extreme. And it's also sort of what you mentioned at the beginning, putting them on a pedestal, right? Okay, so it's how we sort of lionize and valorize them, and then it's okay, I'm a super... So they, they can't do normal things, right? Like, mm -hmm. they can't just, all right, I'm going to go to place X and just have dinner. And like, no, because then a thousand people, particularly if they're, like, you know, well-known, right? Like, they're going to all run up to them and, like, all be in their face, and it's like, okay, I this is not normal. I can't do this. And, or that it's like, right, Henry, and we know this from the NBA style, right? Well, then you're flying in women from wherever who you don't have actual relationships with, right? It's all transactional, right? And it, it's just all of it is bad. And the only actual communication you're having is with teammates. And that's a very for a specific thing, right? Imagine like your job. These are the only people you talk to all day, 24-7. Like, okay, I like my coworkers, but mm, is this what I really want to be all the time? It, mm -hmm. It's just it's not healthy and productive. But the, the masses, I don't think, want to hear that story, right? Because, again, it reminds them of, well, this is my life and you know you get the whole well i want to separate from my terrible day i want you to just show up and entertain me for two hours and then worry about your own time on your own time and it's like guys we we need compassion there somewhere you know yeah it's like oh yeah i just want to dissociate from my terrible day and yeah <laughs> but no it's we need to see these people as people and i think some of the problem is athletes don't always see themselves as full people either Go on. That's fair. Yeah, say more. 
Yeah. Um, so there's something in like psychology circles called identity foreclosure. And there's a specific term called athletic identity foreclosure, where uh, growing up, especially if you are really good at sports and you kind of put all your eggs in the athlete basket, um, you might not be able to see yourself as a full person you might just say like i am an athlete that's who i am and it might work out when you're young and you're beating up on the competition right but if you get to an elite level of sport that's likely to stop pretty quickly and so then it's like if you're failing as an athlete you feel like you're failing as a person oh that's so interesting there's a jackie mcmullen did like this big story with ben simmons when he was struggling a little bit and basically she paraphrased it uh as like you know he's just you see like an a on every test right like and like he at that point the question was why won't he shoot threes and she was like he can shoot them in practice and he makes like 40 percent, but he wants to shoot when he makes 45 percent, right like like he mm. just wanted to be like absolutely exceptional at it and that's a you could like uh, once you told me that i saw his i feel like i saw a little bit i'm not diagnosing him i don't know if that's what he had like but but i felt yeah. like, I was like oh he's he feels worthless unless he's perfect and like as on yeah. as an athlete, right? Like and then and that's when the got I got started to get mad like this. I feel like the Sixers fans like just didn't get the most out of him, right? Like I feel like oh, they no. were like, Oh, you're a little tender, you're a little mm-hmm. weak, like mm-hmm. get that fuck mm-hmm. out of here, you know? Like and I'm like, guys, he actually would be really helpful to you. <laughs> like if you would be nice to him. You know? <laughs> and then it's but it's it's almost as though fans see it as an affront. Right mm. to, oh, it's a macho culture. It's a macho right? like, culture. It, yeah, it, it is such an affront. How dare you have feelings or be vulnerable about something? Like this is a problem, right. and I don't like it. Right? I don't like, even. I, th- I feel like they're saying like, how dare feelings be central? Mm, mm, yeah, right? like, yeah, yeah. Like your feelings are part of this, and then every <laughs> super macho person at some point like reaches a certain age or has a certain life experience, and then they're like, I just want to be honest and tell you it was my feeling. It's like. We knew all along, buddy. Everybody has feelings. Like, right. Like, like that's not a surprise. <laughs> we do. Have, we do. <laughs> oh, you have feelings, too. Oh, my God. It's almost you know, like you're a it, human being. Like, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in Osaka's case, I, I, I thought she, you know, her story, I think, was among the more interesting ones because here you have someone who, you know, she's very upfront and open about it serena williams was her was her tennis idol right like mm-hmm, growing up right? mm-hmm. she beats her in a u.s open final which in many ways should be the happiest moment of her life right but it so wasn't right and and oh not only God. from beating the idol but the booze and the crowd who didn't want her to beat serena and then all of the emotions she had right because she already had conflicted emotions to begin with oh my god this person who's amazing who i looked up to i just beat her in this amazing tournament like so that's, I got to deal with that. But wait, these people don't want me to win. Why? And then all of a sudden, I'm now seen as, oh, well, you beat the greatest player of all time. So now you're going to be the greatest player. Whoa, 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 whoa. Like, that's not how this works, right? I, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. But yeah, it is. And now you got to do press conference. You got to do, no, I, I, no, no. I don't, I'm not, I'm not equipped to handle this right now. And the, the vitriol that began because it was Serena and what she faced and people being like, well, clearly you're not tough enough and you can't make it. And it's like, it's not about tough enough right it's about where she is and her feelings in this moment it's like in a way that moment really showcased that we learned nothing from the way we treated serena herself pretty much pretty (laughs) much (laughs) i mean it's pretty fucking sad like i I don't know it's been how many years since serena came on the scene and we're still (laughs) treating female athletes that way we're still treating black athletes that way Mm -hmm. it's it's wild yeah can you tell the story of shikari richardson mm. Uh, yeah, so Shikari Richardson is, you know, one of the great sprinters of our time. Uh, and, uh, so she was disqualified from the Olympic trials. Yeah, uh, because, uh, she had been smoking pot and tested positive for that. Um, and, uh, she was, uh, mourning a death in her family and kind of using it to blow off steam, I guess, using it as a mental health kind of way um to cope and i don't know it's really interesting the experts i talked to for this book in the substance use chapter are kind of like well maybe pot isn't that bad <laughs> and it's like yeah thanks that's what the rest of us think too 
Well, it's super confusing, right? Like it, it's, um, years ago I did, in, interviewed NBA people about performance enhancing drugs and mm -hmm. talked to this one super elite trainer and he was like, as a, just the way stats work. He's like, I work like basically a hundred percent of the elite NBA players I work with smoke pot. He's like, so I assume it's performance enhancing because otherwise how could it be that all mm -hmm. the best players in the world use the same drug? Mm. And I was like, oh, that's a fucking mind fuck right there. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, and then actually Bill Walton's buddy wrote a story about how basically like the, the athlete's life is so overstimulated that like anything that makes you able to just like relax Calm. To, like, is, is helpful. You're, you did a lot of good reporting on just like this topic of like, where are we? Like, why is it banned for Shakari Richardson anyway? Right? Like, Mm -hmm. and then you know does it help does it hurt like you kind of i thought you had an interesting collection of just like views here if you could just talk a little more about what you learned yeah so i mean i i don't think anyone has found any evidence that it's performance enhancing uh to the comment you got from the trainer i would kind of be like well then why do so many athletes drink like that's not performance enhancing i'm with you i don't think it. anyone yeah. would argue it is yeah um but yeah i think like yeah, it helps people relax. That's not performance enhancing. Um, it might bring out, like, I think the jury's still out as to whether it, like, could exacerbate feelings of depression or anxiety in the long run, even though it feels like in the moment, like, it's helping. So I think the experts I talked to would largely caution athletes about using it uh, for those reasons. But at the same time, it shouldn't be this highly stig stigmatized substance. Yeah, it feels a little to me like, um, I mean, after Malice in the Palace, there was a lot of like examination in the NBA about just like how red state America views the NBA and like, you know, black players going into the stands and punching white people was like, yeah. lit some cultural trash <laughs> fire or something. And um, yes, and like, and then so suddenly they have to wear button down shirts because we need to implicate these people who are nervous about this. And it's like, I feel like marijuana is just like, I, my personal take is that I don't think the league cares about marijuana at all. Their program is super soft. The testing is super soft. Like you can mm -hmm. fail 550 tests in a row and no one would even know. That's the yeah. But um, <laughs> but they just need to look like, if you look like you're permitting marijuana, it offends some fans, right? I, th I feel like yeah, totally. that's what it feels like to me, right? Shakari Richardson is supposed to look like someone, she's supposed to talk like someone who wouldn't just smoke pot because her mom died, right? She's supposed to be like, mm -hmm somehow more goody two shoes than that or something or i don't know like, is that fair <laughs> i think that is fair and it goes back to what i was saying about like putting athletes on pedestals and seeing them as role yeah. models and these like perfect people and yeah i just think that's kind of silly they and shikari talked about it you know where she said you know I, do you know what it's like to have to perform in public in front of people when you are grieving or going through something and to have to tamp my feelings down and not show them because again to henry's point somebody in a red state in the middle of the country has to feel comfortable about you like fuck right. your comfort like <laughs> you know what i mean like what like why does that matter like i'm not comfortable right now at this moment you know mm-hmm mm -hmm. she just needs to know sock a sick day <laughs> yeah, pretty much <laughs> actually yeah <laughs> Except she won, right? She won those trials. If, she sure I, did. She did, yeah. I just saw her again. Not been... back. And if, yeah. by the way, like right now, ripped. I don't know if you guys oh, her, she's like... tearing it up right now. I'm like, uh, yeah, you guys, I think you were obviously wrong because she's fine. Like, she's really She was kind of slight uh, back when this happened, but not anymore. <laughs> Look at her. She's already back. She's going to kill somebody. Like, she's no, like, she she yeah. she should be crushing this summer in Paris uh, for Team USA for sure. Um, Olympic trials will be in Oregon again in June, I imagine, sometime around then. Um no, the, I I love all of this stuff. It it is so fascinating, and it 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 takes me back to a part of the of the book, truly, where a hypnotist who has no actual <laughs> medical degrees in anything was maybe the person who started the whole idea of having sports psychology as a thing and teams doing it. What? Tell us about this hypnotist. <laughs> oh my god, I love this part of the book so much. It might be my favorite little part. Um. <laughs> I just, I'm like sitting in New York Public Library, like reading this guy's memoir from 1951, and I'm like, what is happening here? 
Um, so this guy's name is David F. Tracy, uh, a sports psychology historian called him kind of a flim flam artist, which is an amazing quote. If I, <laughs> um, so this guy, uh, he wasn't the first sports psychologist to embed with a team. He was the second. Um, the first was Coleman R. Griffith, mm -hmm. who, uh, worked with the Cubs, uh, in the late 1930s. And then, uh, this guy, David F. Tracy, um, he he worked with the uh, St. Louis Browns, uh, the baseball mm -hmm. team. Um, and uh, yeah, he was a hypnotist. Uh, he seemed pretty aware at the time that the team might have been doing it for the headlines and not to Literally. actually have him help the players. <laughs> uh, he was eventually like forbidden from talking to the team during the game, which I think says a lot. Um, but yeah, he would just like, hypnotize guys and like i mean hypnosis is something that is kind of still used today but in a much different way like um i talked to someone who, for the book who uses hypnosis and it's more like teaching them self-hypnosis techniques and like setting intentions and mm -hmm. um just giving people more control over their own minds and mm -hmm. she she joked like yeah it's not like you see you know, I always tell people, like, if you see athletes, like, clucking like chickens around noon every day, that's my doing. Like, it's not, yeah, it's not like that. Yeah, thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> but uh, this guy, I think, was more toward the chicken clucking end of the spectrum. Uh, <laughs> but that's, I, I, it's so interesting because that, obviously, the, the teams, the, the Browns used it for sure for headlines. Because you can see in, in, in the book, you describe, like, the, the owner the coach, the GM, like, brought their wives, like, oh, you're going to hypnotize us all one by one because back then, that was what hypnosis is, right? Get on stage, and when I blink my finger or snap my fingers, you're going to all of a sudden cluck like a chicken or do right. whatever. But ultimately, as you pointed out, it is about calming your state of mind, right? So that, because mm -hmm. we had, who do we have on Henry talking about this where athlete performance, it's about mind state, right? Where they are and the clarity allows them to perform, like, at a certain level. And I think even David F. Tracy said in, in the memoir, you quoted him, uh, Julie, it's not about turning a 220 hitter or a 300 hitter. It's about a person who's already talented enough to hit 300 that I have him in the right same frame of mind so he can hit 300. Right. And I actually think that is a very useful way of looking at sports psychology is like, it's not going to totally transform you. Um, it's going to like tweak the edges of your game and make sure that you're capable of living up to your potential. Also, I feel like, you know, how many different circumstances can you be you in, right? Like, uh, if, you know, we just talked about Shakari Richardson having a death in the family, like, and then she freaking did win, you mm -hmm. know, like, like right. you know, she can do her thing with even with that craziness, right? Or, um, you know, maybe you're getting a rash in the Lynx uh, training camp and mm -hmm. it, your anxiety is grabbing you in a way that makes you unable to perform right like that would be totally mm -hmm. understandable right like i feel like maybe this is where the psychology part comes in is like you know the thing that would rattle the circumstances like how many different circumstances can you cope with and still is kind of like go to work right mm -hmm. and maybe you mm -hmm. expand the list right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the you know the, there's sort of a balance here right between mental health um and performance right um right. and i feel like that sort of because as a as a coach myself when i coach in high level like swimmers who try to qualify for senior nationals olympic trials things of that nature so much of it was about when we would dabble into this area was about performance right how do i make it so that you are performing well and not and this was in the you know early to mid 2000s not thinking but should I be leading with wellness first, right? And this is, I'm a 20 something year old, know nothing about it, right? Like, but like, should I be leading with how are you doing first, right? And those factors to then figure out, are you even in the right place so that we can begin to optimize you for performance, right? And that's that, that's that balance of human being versus we have this stated goal and mission that we have to achieve, which is you doing this thing, right? And, and mm -hmm. who should be in charge of that, right? Because Henry and I certainly agree. It damn sure shouldn't be the teams, right? They're not the people who need to be in charge of that. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think it's really complicated. Like uh, some, you know, some teams actually increasingly, almost all professional teams and a lot of college teams employ sports psychologists. And uh, Laisha Clarendon actually was one of the people who told me like, 
well, we don't always feel comfortable going to the teams. Like we want to also go outside the teams and just have like money for to be reimbursed for those like hefty medical bills. And it's like, how do you trust the team you're working for to have your best interest in mind? So the whole, it's the same with like ACLs and stuff, right? Like they're just, yeah, they, they, the team just wants to roll you out there most cases, right? Um, mm-hmm. Um, who's doing it well? Which teams? Yeah, or just like people, like you know, where where, where is this happening in a way that you you know, with all your homework, you're like, this is a this is a good model. I thought the Mavericks actually have a pretty good mm-hmm. model, where um, which is I, I guess both surprising and not like. <laughs> I mean, like, obviously the team culture around the Mavericks leaves a lot to be desired, uh, but also, you know, they invest in things. Um, so uh, Don Kalkstein is the guy who has headed up the Mavericks, like, sports psychology uh, department for quite a long time. I think he was the first uh, such person in the league. Um, so he's been around a while, which is part of establishing that culture of, um, you know, we can talk about this stuff. Um, and I know one of the things he told me was that they also uh, work with players as families. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm like, oh, that makes total sense to me. Like you're looking at like the whole package and not just like one piece of it. Yeah. You know that, 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 that makes total sense to me. You know, I, I wonder, you know, because the, the athletes that have been, that, talk about this stuff and who've been sort of the ones you mentioned as like first foremost we're talking about Naomi Osaka DeMar DeRozan Kevin Love in the NBA uh, talked about it I, I was listening to a podcast recently where an MMA fighter uh, talked about it which I'm like wow in that sport because that is just like you know if, if the NBA is caveman in, in relation to this stuff <laughs> MMA is like what's before caveman whatever whatever that is they're they're in there they're mm-hmm. in, in that region so to have um to have athletes speak about it and to the point where they're willing to sort of either push teams or say, no, we need to focus on this and have it in our hands and our control. I think that that's meaningful. And I think, you know, hopefully in like the next, I don't know, (laughs) change is slow 50 years. This, this model looks a lot better. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard because one of the questions I get asked the most are like, okay, so what are the answers, Julie? Like what, what can we do? And it's like, I don't think I have all the answers. I just think we need to keep, funneling more money and resources to athletes and also look at the holistic picture look at coaches mental health look at front office staff's mental health uh look at you know youth athletes' mental health i i mean that's in a way that's all we can do is just keep like asking the right questions and offering the right resources what um i was interested in the uh psychedelics mention like I know, mm-hmm. like I, you know, I I am a Michael Pollan fan. I I know that his like <laughs> you know, there's like there's like it's not. I guess I don't know where the research is to be honest. I know there's like much more research than there used to be about this could like legit. Oh, I see your cat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let me get out of the way. <laughs> uh, why are you there's a visitor? <laughs> um, and there's a little bit of you said there's one study about the effect of like psychedelics in elite athletes. Like what's what do we know about this? Yeah, I guess we still don't know a ton. Um we know that um a lot of the studies that have been done haven't included elite athletes just because they're such a special population and because athletes are very serious for the most part about what they put into their bodies and when and why. Um But in non-athlete populations, we have seen some promising effects, especially for conditions like PTSD and depression um, with different drugs. Uh, You know, they have to be used in the right environments. You know, ideally, you're not like going to Peru and doing this on your own. Um, (laughs) But you're you're not not Aaron Rodgers are taking ayahuasca in the middle of wherever the hell he does it. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I would say that's probably, and I did talk to Aaron Rodgers for their, for a Sports Illustrated piece about psychedelic use in athletes. And I was like, so are you using this for mental health? He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Sounds about I right. Mean, at the same time, though, he does talk about like how it improved his, you know, feeling. So I'm like, okay, are you sure about that? Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on with him. Are we but... having a hard time using the phrase mental health, Aaron? <laughs> right, right, yeah. 
I think we might be. Um, <laughs> but no, so ideally, ideally, you're using the drugs in a very controlled environment. You're getting the appropriate therapy. And there was a great Wired story a while back about how the therapy you get with psychedelic use, like say you're using ketamine, uh, for example, to treat depression, you know, that just because you're getting therapy in the room doesn't mean it's like the best available therapy. Uh, so I think it's really tricky and we're still learning a lot, but I think um, researchers are interested in doing more work with elite athlete populations. Um, the uh, To go back to um, MMA, like I think they were interested in doing like a trial with Johns Hopkins, which is one of the leading uh, institutions for research in psychedelics. Now that didn't pan out, but um, there are some leagues asking the right questions. Uh, I don't think you're going to see like a trial of NFL athletes anytime soon, for okay. example, but I, there's still a lot we don't know. And uh, people are really cautious about saying anything, but yeah, it's certainly an interesting area and it's worth exploring, especially because these are things athletes are already doing in the off season. Um, they're experimenting a little bit so um but yeah it's it's about finding the right conditions there's um i'm an nyu alum and like nyu was one of the places that did early research on like cancer diagnosis anxiety and do, mm. do you know anything about this like they mm. I, I, this was years ago i thought it was fascinating because like people would get a terminal cancer diagnosis so like oh my gosh i have like four months to enjoy my family but they couldn't enjoy their family because they were so anxious about the diagnosis right so then mm -hmm. this NYU trial is basically just like you're going to do, as you're describing, a controlled environment, like one session of, I think there was like psilocybin in that one. And um, mm -hmm. and then people are like, literally, like, completely, I mean, there were anecdotal reports where the people were just like, this is the greatest thing I ever did. Now <laughs> I'm like, walking on the beach with my family and laughing and having big dinners and like, just like, enjoying my remaining time. And I was like, now that made a bigger impression on me. I'm like, oh, like, that's like, a... it does feel to me like, the, the reason that I would think about this with athletes is it does seem like a, a, not everybody, but a lot of people become elite athletes by being kind of obsessive. Right. And like, mm -hmm. which is a form of anxiety, right? Like, which, right. you know, comes with a lot of other, mm -hmm. you know, tricks, addiction, tricky, all sorts of things in your life. Yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. like, oh, there's probably some people out there who could use some. For some sure. Do, therapy. <laughs> you know, we always like sport is just, it, it's just this interesting place because it's always used as sort of like our, I always say it's a it's a mirror reflection of society, right? Because it's a microcosm, but it can also be a leader in things because of the value that we place on it as a society, right? Right. So it can be something perhaps that leads the way in this, but you know, it would require people who are within these these institutions to have the best interest of the athletes and people in mind. And as Henry right. knows, that's not really <laughs> we don't find a lot of that in these leagues. It's not a thing. <laughs> No, we certainly don't. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I think it is about, to go back to Shikari Richardson, it is about like the upkeep of this image of the athlete as someone, like quote, very heavy air quotes, who is respectable, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What about the media here? Like, mm. you know, a lot of these things come up in the workplace and we kind of know how to deal with it a little bit, right? It's like Naomi Osaka as a like manager could get a day off, right? Like, Mm -hmm. She worked at Kinko's or whatever, right? But um, but she's supposed to be on the mic, right? And like, um, or Shakari Richardson, same thing, right? Like maybe if she, if they didn't have media there, none of we, no one would have to know any of this, right? Right. Like she yeah. just right. Runs fast, right? Um, mm -hmm. like, how do we do this right if we're the media, right? Like, we're, we want to ask questions about how you win or why you didn't perform well today, but maybe we shouldn't always get answers i don't know yeah yeah i've been trying to ask this question of people especially people in the media for a few years now basically since naomi osaka bowed out of the french open um i i really want to write an article about like rethinking athlete press conferences i don't know if anyone has like a great way to reimagine them but maybe that's interesting too right um if it's like we just need to keep doing what we're doing but i'll be a little more humane about it um, I think that's still a decent point. Um, I, I think, I think, you know, we, in the media, we shouldn't be friends with athletes, but I think we can maintain a professional distance while still caring about them as people while still making sure our questions in press conferences and elsewhere are intelligent. 
Because I think uh, we've all seen press conferences where the questions are just like, what are you doing, man? That call in the fourth quarter was stupid or, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, okay, is that, is that even journalism at that point? Um, and so I think we can all be a little more thoughtful. I think we can work with athletes to tell their stories. I think it's really hard in this day and age because of like, you know, gestures wildly at social media um but uh and, <laughs> um and also outlets like the players tribune uh you know the players tribune publishes some really moving stuff but it's not quite journalism it's like exists in this like liminal space mm -hmm. uh between journalism and just like straight pr right um and so I think it's hard for athlete or for the media to even like win the right to kind of tell athlete stories, whereas the media used to be like the first option. Um, so I think we need to oh, like so yeah. just increase our credibility however we can. And that's by caring about people. I, I think you're dead on. This is something that I know that speaks to Henry directly because he is all about the way you get to do things is by earning trust. All right. Yeah. We, not us, but we as the media have done a poor, like there's none. We, we have earned zero right now. And that's why that relationship between athlete and media is what it is right now, which is non-existent, right? Unless it's someone getting fluffed something for PR that we just drop out there. And it's like, that's not news. That's not journalism, right? Which mm -hmm. again, is something that, that Henry cares about. Well, I, as you were talking, like press conferences to me, like it's probably mostly useful for like holding powerful people to account, right? So this is like, you know, the White House press corps, like, how dare mm -hmm. you invade Beirut or whatever, right? Like, I right. feel like that's kind right. of yeah. like the model. And like, it always felt, I mean, from the first time I was in an NBA, like post game scrum or whatever, I was like, we're going to haul like, like mm -hmm. who would it be like, you know, Eric Snow out here and just right. like mm -hmm. roll questions at him about the third quarter. And like, right. like right. it's so uncomfortable. And, and not to mention like, <laughs> stupid in the sense yeah. stupid as a business practice for the media it's not like what eric snow says in that setting does anything for the business like you know Correct. we're not selling right. newspapers with his like pat answers about their, it's just like this weird trial and, like i quickly noticed i was like oh well that time Stephen a smith was a local columnist so like you know it's like he would walk to the loading dock with mm -hmm. eric snow that's and then, the like, stuff like, you want and that was the only mm. interesting conversation anybody had in the building all night right Right. And I can, so I was like, well, obviously, if you just want to know what's actually happening here, you have to earn trust, right? Like, mm -hmm. it just feels still exact. Like, you know, I don't, I'd be interested to know who did Shikari Richardson actually tell the real version of events to? Like, it probably wasn't oh, a press conference. Oh, that's a great right? question. I don't think it was. I can't remember off the top of my head who she told, but yeah, that, I would love to. Love to have been in, have been that person, have been in that person's shoes, you know, see what they said. And yeah. You know, we, we mentioned, um, you know, what are we entitled to know as, as journalists? What's the public as fans entitled to know? A, a story that's so interesting to me um, is currently in the NBA right now, the Andrew Wiggins um, situation, a place with mm -hmm. Golden State Warriors. So last year, he missed a significant amount of time uh, towards the second half of the regular season. Um, came back in time for the playoffs, but um, it was just a family family reason. And, and but at first it wasn't even that. No one knew, and the team wasn't saying. Um, and people were like, you know, well, what are what, it's our right to know certain things. And I'm like, but is it? And now he's 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 out again indefinitely. No time when he's going to return, and it's a personal family matter. And to me, I don't think we have a right to know what that personal family matter is. I just right. don't like, I, like, I get it. He plays for your favorite team and you're missing an important player, but if his team is fine with it and uh, I don't like, there's nothing that we deserve to know. Now, if there is some media person who has a great relationship and we has earned the trust and they can fine, but I doubt that'll ever happen. And I think that's fair, but there is this hankering of like wanting to know when then it turns into you guys make 40 million a year. And it's like, but what does that have to do with anything? What? Why don't, you, why don't you ask the CEO of freaking J.P. Morgan why he does the shit he does? And he makes $200 million a year. Like, here totally. we go. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it's depressing. It is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, like, look, fans have this, like, totally irrational, like, we own you mentality, which mm -hmm. is, like, mm -hmm. like that, that's always wrong. But, um, but at the same time, like, without that obsession, right? So, um. You know, like LeBron can sell Kias. Does he sell that Kia deal? Is that still going on? Maybe. Well, the NBA has a Kia deal, that's for sure. <laughs> for a while, yeah, it was yeah. just LeBron and a Kia every time you turn your TV. Um, like, <laughs> he can sell Kias because we are obsessed with him even off the court. 
right? Like, mm-hmm. so he's reaping the rewards of our mm-hmm. weird obsession with his off court life, right? Like, mm-hmm. we care about right. his children, we care about Taco Tuesday and all this stuff because, like, you know, like he's it's part of why he's so he could be a completely reclusive, he could be like Kareem, right? Mm-hmm. And just like not mm-hmm. play that game, he'd make mm-hmm. a lot less money, right? But he's like, no, nah, I'm in, like, so to me, I'm like, yeah, you're, you should expect people to be weird about it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they're gonna want it self right. dinner in the restaurant, like, this is just. Maybe they're wrong to interrupt your dinner, but it's mm-hmm. predictable that people are going to do that, yep. right? Yep. Uh-huh. So that's where I think it's like a little like it's tough to know like what the you know how to draw a line if you're Andrew Wiggins, right? Like, a, I, if I were him, I would be like, I don't know if I would ever do this, um, but I would be thinking about who is the person in the media with like a big reputation and a lot of trust who you would like lay it out there too mm-hmm. right and like in mm-hmm. right have a one-on-one meaningful like mm-hmm. there's a little hotel fake fire in the back you know like this, right. for some reason <laughs> you can only have that conversation with the hotel fake fire fireside chat back. love it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know what the problem with that is though is that sports media is kind of crumbling like that i mean yeah yeah like there's so few outlets for good sports journalism now and it's like well what do you what do you do Henry, was that was that up close and personal with Roy Firestone? Was he the guy on ESPN back in the day? Is he no, or is he not, is he the dude? <laughs> yeah, I mean that was he had the fireplace, right? But like, yeah. but I've noticed those still. Like, I, you know, in my time at ESPN, there were moments of like we need to set up a, t- a place for like a big interview, right? And and you know, in my mind, that would be like um, actually the coolest was at one point a friend owned a bar in Brooklyn and let us shoot with like the, all the raw brick and there was like side mm-hmm. light sunlight mm. from the side. it looked really cool and everyone's like ah it looks kind of like a garage and I was like meanwhile like a hundred percent of the time that I was involved with like somebody saying it was all a hundred like I know we'll get a hotel suite and, like and yeah in my mind I'm like when you when I see the interview I'm like why are they in a hotel suite like it just mm-hmm. looks so, right. it's a very <laughs> strange place to have that conversation <laughs> like, like Folks, you guys got a hotel room to talk about <laughs> sadness. Like it's just weird. Anyway, right. Mind game, mind game out today. March Julie Pligman, is there? If there's one thing you want people to take from the book, Julie, what is it? I think it would just be like, how cool is it that we can treat athletes as people, and you can take these lessons from athletes and hopefully apply them to your own life. If an athlete can ask for help. So can you. Well said. Where can people find you? Uh, They can find me at JM Kliegman on social media and in various publications. Uh, There's an excerpt of Mind Game on Sports Illustrated's website. Uh, It is the hypnotist part. So... Ah. See, I mean, I read that. I was like, how could people not? This is this is great. Like this dude, the hypnot- like this is awesome. Who, who, wants to, who wants to do that? Folks, yeah. Uh, Mind game. Get it wherever books are sold. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it.